This is a story about a love cut short. A heart inconsolable and grief that led to the most famous Mughal mausoleum we know and still gaze in awe at today. It was a gesture of love and everlasting memory. This is the Taj Mahal. India is a vast peninsula with an extensive history. It is diverse in religion, culture, and language. India has seen many empires throughout its lengthy history. The Mughal Empire brought with them an Indo-Persian culture that is evident in the magnificent forts and the tombs they left behind. The Mughal Empire was founded in the mid-16th century by its first emperor, Babur, who was the descendant of Taimur on his father's side and Genghis Khan on his mother's side. At its height, the Mughal Empire spanned almost the entire Indian peninsula and what is today Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan. Unable to retain any territory in his home of what is today Uzbekistan, Babur began his ambitions by establishing himself in Kabul and eventually pushing further south into the Indian subcontinent. Babur died in 1530 and was succeeded by his son and second emperor of the Mughal Empire, Humayun. The Mughal Empire under his rule was briefly interrupted as he was exiled to Persia. This is of significance because it was here that the Mughal Empire obtained the influence of Persian culture through diplomatic alliances and marriage. The Mughal Empire was restored under the rule of Humayun in 1555 and one year later in 1556, Humayun died. His wife, Bega Begum, grieving over her beloved husband, built him a grand tomb funded by her and not surprisingly, she hired Persian architects to build what became Humayun's tomb. Humayun's tomb is of immense significance in our narrative as it was the first garden tomb in the Indian subcontinent and it was also the first structure to use red sandstone at such an immense scale. It ushered in the concept of building a mass garden grave to honor a loved one. It was a masterpiece of admiration and amazement that distinguished a loved one and kept their memory alive after their death. Humayun's tomb provides us a glimpse into the familiar structure and styling cues of what will become the much larger Taj Mahal.
Here, we expand our focus on the first five Mughal emperors, Babur, Humayun, Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan. Although buried in their Mughal empire, today their tombs are scattered across three countries. Babur in Kabul, Afghanistan, Humayun in New Delhi, India, Akbar in Agra, India, Jahangir in Lahore, Pakistan, and Shah Jahan in Agra, India. As lessons were learned and each emperor wanted the grandest of all mausoleums, we can clearly notice the enhancements, growth, and rise in complexity of each emperor's final resting place. When we compare the structures, we begin to see more complex designs with bigger minarets and larger assertive domes. However, the fifth mausoleum stands out. It is distinctive. Red sandstone was predominantly used in all the tombs, including the Taj Mahal. But this one was kept in much more prestigious and beautiful ivory white marble that covered the red sandstone. This is the epitome of Mughal Muslim tomb design, the Taj Mahal. Despite Shah Jahan being buried here, it was never intended to be his tomb. In fact, he never built it for himself. Love and sorrow built the Taj Mahal. For you see, Shah Jahan built it for the woman he loved. Though many of his marriages were political by nature, this one was different. This one was out of love. And this love of the fifth emperor of the Mughal Empire was a Persian woman by the name of Mumtaz Mahal. She bore Shah Jahan 14 children and also played a political role alongside her husband having a say in political matters. He was so in love with her, he never indulged in any emotional or sexual relationships with his other wives. His life was all about her, and he truly loved her. During the childbirth of their 14th child, Shah Jahan's beloved Mumtaz Mahal died. He was devastated. With an understanding of the brief history of how the Taj Mahal came to be, let us get into the details of the Taj Mahal. Join us on our drive, and with the help of a tour guide, we will get a more comprehensive understanding of fascinating details about the Taj Mahal you probably never knew before. We are no strangers to road trips, 
and having driven all of Japan coast to coast, we are quite the seasoned adventure seekers. Our drive began in New Delhi and brought us south to the city of Agra, which is about a three hour drive covering a distance of just over 200 kilometers. Having spent a few days earlier in India, we were well aware that driving here is a little more adventurous than what we are used to in Japan and North America. It was quite refreshing to experience something new. Once out of the city, we found ourselves on a surprisingly tranquil highway that stretched as far as we could see. Now New Delhi is quite dense, but once we got out of the city, it appeared life around us ceased to exist with the exception of these gatherings that we would hesitate to call villages. Soon enough, we began seeing the familiar dense atmosphere, including the traffic and recognizable local animal pedestrians that unquestionably paid no mind to the traffic laws. Finally, a glimpse of what we have always seen in pictures and screens peeked through the trees. We made it. Through the heat, traffic, and even our own excitement, we finally made it. Remembering the history I've studied, the emperors and their Mughal empire, there it was, in real life, we were looking at the same thing Shah Jahan looked at. And he was there, and now, so were we. Once we parked our car, we were swarmed by tuk-tuk drivers that are willing to take you the close to one kilometer walk to one of the entrance gates. Amongst them, we met Irshad, who turned out to be quite a helpful fella. Scammers are abundant, but he seemed humble, and he wasn't pushing the money talk on us, so we scooped him along, and it was surely worth it. He addressed details that we would not have known otherwise, and I feel that without him, we would have left that day missing out on a lot of information that linked the Taj Mahal with its story, and it made our visit much more meaningful. Now we are standing, it is the four courtyard area of Taj Mahal. Why we call this four courtyard? Because from here four gate and four garden. So we are coming this gate, this is the western gate. Second gate you can see the symmetrical side eastern gate, behind of me south gate and fourth north gate from here. In that time, dynastic time, this gate name is different. This is called Fatehpuri Begum gate. Why? Because Shah Jahan, why Fatehpuri Begum, she is buried there. 20,000 people working in Taj Mahal. Those people are coming from Iran and Afghanistan and those people are living behind of this gate. Same descending family is still living now. This is the north gate of Taj Mahal. In India, this is the third largest gate. First, Buland Darwaza in Fatehpur Sikri in Agra. It's about 45 kilometers far from here. Second gate in India, Delhi, India gate. This is the third largest gate in India. This gate on the top, you can see the white color dome. Can you count how many domes are there in the middle? 11. 11, exactly. 11 front side and 11 to behind back side. So 11 plus 11, 22. It means Taj Mahal whole construction is complete. Took 22 years. Third beauty in this gate, you can see the writing. Yeah. Three side of border, black yeah. writing. Yeah. It is the Arabic language. Yes. Okay. Chapter of the Quran. Mm -hmm. This language looks like yes, a painting and color, but it is not color, not painting. It 
first they dig out the marble with the hammer with the chisel then another stone they put in the marble black one wow. this is the black onyx that time so this isn't a painting no painting they dig it and then put marble exactly oh. and this is the black onyx stone you can see the leaf flower design, red, yellow, green. They are all precious and some are precious stone inlaid to white marble. Those are real stone inlaid to white marble. Let's take a minute here and grasp this inlay process that he mentioned. I purchased these plates as souvenirs from the shops here that still use the same techniques by the direct descendants of the Taj Mahal workers. They start with a slab of marble and chisel into it, carving out the floral designs or the verses from the Quran. They cut the gemstones with surgical precision and inlay them into the chiseled marble. Finally, they proceed to smooth and sand it to a mirror finish. Now imagine the time, skill, and finesse that is required to cut these stones without cracking them and inlaying them perfectly. The simplest mistake would crack and ruin the whole plate. Now this is just one plate. Imagine having the responsibility of inlaying these gemstones on this unfathomable and immense scale. Imagine having to do all of this without a single mistake. The thought of that is to say the least mind-boggling and jaw-dropping. 28 different stones are utilized for inlaying, such as carnelian, agate, turquoise, lapis lazuli, coral, onyx, cat's eye, jade, and bloodstone. These stones were imported from several places such as Tibet, Rajasthan, Punjab, China, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, and Arabia. One more thing, you can see letter, bottom to top, size of the letter, font, it looks like a same, but it is not same. They are in the V-shape like that. Bottom is a smaller, top it's bigger. If the same size letter you can't read is top. That's why architect make in the V-shape. So this is the center line of Taj Mahal. This line is started from here and going to a straight Mumtaz grave in the symmetrical. Not only is the main mausoleum symmetrical, the whole Taj Mahal complex, gardens, and even the trees are symmetrical as well. It adds another level of appeal in its simplicity, while ironically, adding another level of complexity. The explicit nature of having everything on either side of the center line symmetrical is an engineering feat in itself that takes time and more importantly, absolute proficiency and impeccable technique. The level of this faultless design is apparent when you realize that following this insignificant line will lead you through the absolute center of the entire Taj Mahal complex all the way to the tomb of its main occupant, Mumtaz Mahal. As you advance through the main gate, you are struck with a severe case of tunnel vision. An optical illusion is set to make the Taj Mahal seem as it is moving away from you as you walk through this main gate. Before long, you are received by the main mausoleum in all its glory and you will find yourself at the gardens containing the pavilions. More symmetry is visible here as the main gate from the inside looks identical and symmetrical to the view we observed earlier from the outside. The symmetry does have some inconsistencies as we see here. Can you guess what's the changes in this gate? Hmm? Yes. Yeah. Exactly brother, you are right. God. The chapter of the Quran is different. King Shah Jahan made this Taj Mahal memory of his wife Mumtaz and she is not Indian. She is Persian from Iran. She died in 1630. After one year, Taj Mahal started 1631 and completed 1653. 22 years. White marble coming from Makrana in Rajasthan place which is 360 kilometers far from here. In all Mughal places you have to find this is from red, this is from Why? They have a reason. First reason, Agra is the capital of the Mughal and this is stone you have to easily find in Agra. Second of reason, this is a very cheaper stone, cheaper with the marble. Third reason, no effective color of this stone, it's the same color, red color. So this is the same stone? Same stone. 
white marble now we have to find yellow dome it's not 100% white bottom side is clean uh, I see, I see. but before 5 years sorry before 5 years the all marble it's yellow like the dome but they have to clean every 5 years after with the mud pack therapy they have to use mud on the marble and paste it 2 month 2 and half month 3 month after they wash with the water with the with the soap it's clean because mud absorbs all dust or pollution no use any color with this marble no use any chemical just mm. only used to be mud pack therapy on the top is the black chemical just entire on the top can you guess how tall is it it's just a black thing 10 meter that time it was gold but right now it is brass why it is brass now because after british ruler they took it gold and they make replicate even brass when they put it over Now the plausibility of this story has been endlessly debated. There were in fact multiple thefts of precious items from the Taj Mahal, but the specifics of what was stolen will always be shrouded in fables and myths. Was the pinnacle truly stolen? Some say yes, and others say no. And I suppose we will never be certain. One more thing. See the tower from here? Yes. Two in the right and yes. two in the left. That was one. The tower looks like a straight like that, but they are not straight. They are tilted 2.5 degrees slightly outside like that. See that they are bottom and top. Why they are making slightly? Because in the future, earthquake, bomb blasts, so those pillars never fell down the building. They have to fall down outside. That's why architect makes slightly straight. Mm -hmm. It was very very smart. The towers he is speaking of are the four minarets that are on all four corners of the main mausoleum. Each one towers at about 43 meters or 141 feet high. It is quite challenging to see the minuscule tilt of these minarets with the naked eye. Look at this picture. Compare the straight lines of the main mausoleum with the minarets and if you look at the entire picture, you will notice that they are indeed leaning outwards and away from the main structure. While here in the garden area, you will notice an insignificant building right at the edge. This is a water palace. It is unique because the dome is made out of marble, but the rest of the building is made with red sandstone. It's quite interesting to view the contrast between the two different materials in one building. Pursuing the perfect symmetry, you will again discover an identical water palace on the adjacent side as well. Walking further north, you reach the most northerly part of the entire complex, the Riverfront Terrace. Although the main mausoleum is the center of attention, there are in fact two more buildings on either side, a mosque and a guest house. Constructed from the familiar red sandstone, this building is the mosque. It is a little more than 20 meters high or 66 feet. Due to it being a mosque, it is located on the west side of the Taj Mahal in the direction of Mecca where Muslims face when they pray. And for a bit of enjoyment, here is a cute monkey we saw climbing the mosque's wall. On the east side sits the guest house. It is called the Jawab, which means answer in Arabic. Now some speculate that it might have been built just to balance out the symmetry with the mosque on the west side. Regardless, it is said to have entertained and accommodated important visitors. And finally, the pièce de résistance, arguably the only structure here that most people who come visit the Taj Mahal are familiar with. And how can you blame them? It demands your attention and respect. It captivates you with its completely white exterior. Its scale is indefinable. Its craftsmanship unmatched. It is 68 meters or 223 feet high and standing more than 350 years, it still affirms prestige. As I got closer, I was really able to take in the fine points of almost every marble slab. 
It is unthinkable to comprehend the man hours it took to meticulously complete this building, piece by piece and inch by inch. I took some time to appreciate where I was, what I was looking at, and how I am privileged to be able to physically touch one of the seven wonders of the world. And although impossible, I would like to share with you this experience as much as I can with the following footage. I want you to appreciate the fine details present on almost every surface of this marvel. The Taj Mahal. The entrance to the mausoleum brings you to the rather modest octagon-shaped inner chamber. You will not find decorations or extravagant jewelry, as Muslim tradition forbids elaborate decorations of graves. There are two tombs here. The smaller geometrically centered tomb belongs to Mumtaz Mahal, while the larger off-centered tomb to the west belongs to her husband, the fifth emperor, Shah Jahan. This is the only element in this entire complex that is not symmetrical. These tombs are in fact replicas, as the real ones are found in the lower chamber. Observing Muslim tradition, you can notice how comparatively modest and simple the walls are compared with the replicas. So, if everything was painstakingly engineered to be symmetrical, why is Shah Jahan's tomb so offset? Why is it the only thing that defies this crucial element of symmetry? We stumble on a long disputed legend. North of the entire complex is the Yamuna River. As you cross it, something quite peculiar is perched here. It is called the Moonlight Garden. It may well just be a garden north of the Taj Mahal. This garden, however, is flawlessly aligned with the Taj Mahal. You see, Legend has it that this is the foundation of Shah Jahan's ambition to erect his own tomb identical to his wife's. A black, identical Taj Mahal for himself on the other side of the river, perhaps to be in proportional love with his beloved for eternity. His plans, however, never came to fruition. It is said that Shah Jahan's obsession with building the Taj Mahal took a toll on his empire's expenses. The Taj Mahal is said to have cost around 1 billion US dollars in today's money. In 1657, Shah Jahan became ill, which intensified the war of succession between his four sons. The main contest of power was between Shah Jahan's oldest and favored son, Dara, and his third son, Aurangzeb. Dara, if you recall from earlier in the video, is buried in Humayun's tomb in New Delhi. Many battles ensued which saw Dara fleeing to the west from his brother Aurangzeb. 
Ultimately, one of Dara's generals betrayed him and handed him over to Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb crowned himself emperor in July of 1658. In August 1659, Aurangzeb had his brother Dara and favored successor to the Mughal Empire executed. Aurangzeb deemed his now frail father Shah Jahan incompetent to rule and imprisoned him in Agra Fort where the once great Shah Jahan lived out his years, never again able to visit his beloved wife's grave and only able to get a glimpse of his life's masterpiece, the Taj Mahal. Shah Jahan died in 1666 after eight years of imprisonment, perhaps never able to realize his black Taj Mahal. Fact or fiction, we will never know. We would like to think of it as truth because the only thing better than the Taj Mahal would have been a pair of Taj Mahals peering at each other from opposite sides of the river. And there is nothing wrong with these ambitions of our imagination. We are fortunate to have the Taj Mahal because of these ambitions and imaginations of Shah Jahan. After his death, Shah Jahan was moved and buried in the Taj Mahal. So even though he spent the last eight years of his life incapable of visiting his wife's grave, he would surely rest in peace, buried next to his Mumtaz for eternity. Nearing the end of our day and having truly marveled at every aspect of being here, one thing was quite bothersome that took away from all this greatness that many people painstakingly worked to perfect. Everywhere we looked, people would throw garbage and empty bottles in the gardens and under benches. I found this very ill-mannered and even more disgraceful and embarrassing. Garbage bins are plentiful, yet some people deemed it acceptable to toss their trash everywhere. If your life of adventure ever brings you to this marvel, or any other place, I implore you to be humble and dispose of your trash responsibly, and uphold the work many have perfected just so you may have the opportunity to experience it. Our voyage to the Taj Mahal and India in general was exceptional. We tend to be bold and love to experience various countries. You regularly hear cynical stigmas about India, but I give credit where it is due. I have a philosophy of never accepting what people say about anything and would rather experience it myself, which I did. India was one of the most compelling, fascinating, and culturally rich countries I have visited. The food was incredible, and we were humbled by the hospitality of the various people we met. We hardly got to experience this vast country and only touched on what it has to offer. One thing is certain, India, you have won a place in our hearts and we will be back to relish what else this country has to offer. And for that, thank you, India, and until next time.